When I first started playing the game, and I was, what, nine or 11 months or something like that, I, I just started walking. I would always want to watch my father hit golf balls. I was addicted to it. I was in the garage hitting ball, and he had been in the garage with me, so I unstrapped him out of his high chair and let him walk free, and he walked over and got his putter and went over and set up just like I did. And then I realized, oh my God, he's left-handed. Because my father, to me, appeared the mirror image, I was left-handed. Um, my first golf shots I ever took for the first couple weeks were left-handed. Took him two weeks to figure it out, daddy's not on this side, he's on the other side. So in the middle of a swing, he just stopped. For some reason, I switched and realized my father was actually on the other side. And walked around and set up right-handed. He had learned the golf swing just by observing me. And this is when I knew I had something special. He switched his grip from a left-hander's grip to a right-hander's grip, set up looked at the target and pulled the trigger. If you knew nothing about golf and if you'd landed here from the planet Pluto and they, they sat you down at Augusta, your eyes would go to him. You'd say, who's that guy? That's the guy I want to watch. You'd just be drawn to him. I knew he was going to be the best in the world. It's just gut feeling. I knew he had it. There has never been a human being walk on this planet that's ever won four majors in a row. He was probably the hungriest individual I've ever seen. He had this desire to achieve. He has a drive, a desire to be good. He got amazing God-given ability. He was already the chosen one. And I enjoy watching greatness. When Tiger's on, I want to watch him play. When I saw him the first time, I thought he looked so gorgeous. What a beautiful man. I think he's going to be one of the greatest golfers of all time. The greatest golfer of all time. He's captured all of society throughout the world um, and made people say, you know what, I love golf. And I was only telling people what was going to happen. Now they know. Arden journalists have said, God sits on his shoulder. Some close to him believe fate has determined he grace us with his presence. Many think he's come closer than anyone to conquering the unbeatable game. A few even claim he can walk on water.
charmed life of Eldrick Woods began on December 30th, 1975, in Southern California. Earl Woods, a former Green Beret Lieutenant Colonel who had served in Vietnam, met Kaltita Punsuad, the daughter of a well-to-do Bangkok family in a U.S. Army office in Thailand. They were married in 1969. Eldrick would be their only child. I was more of a uh, friend, best friend, and a very supportive parent, understanding, uh, communicative. Um, we just, we just existed together, coexisted together at a very high level. He's meant a lot to me. I mean, he's not only did he introduce me to the game of golf and, and something I love to do as my passion, but he was always there. My dad was always there. I love to see the competitiveness in him and just allowed it to come out. I played on Saturdays and Sundays, and um, he was always at the 18th Green to meet me, because then I would reward him by going to the putting green, and he and I would putt. It was always competition. Okay, closest to the pin, uh, three out of five. And then I'd win, and he'd say, oh, four out of seven, Daddy. And then he said, let's start all over again. I never wanted to, to admit that I'd beat him. But he wanted to compete in everything, everything. He just loved it. While serving in Vietnam, Earl had owed his life several times over to a fellow colonel in the South Vietnamese Army. Vuong Dang Phong. They were buddies. Earl called him Tiger. Tiger and I just got along famously. Um, he was a great guy, um, fearless, really aggressive, and all he wanted to do was be a school teacher. That was his aspiration. And uh, when Nam fell, I didn't know whether he made it out or not. Earl began to call Eldrick Tiger. He hoped it would inspire the young man to acquire all the qualities of his friend. It's an honor to, to have his name, to have that nickname, because, you know, hearing all the war stories from my father, how much he meant to my father, uh, not only saving his life numerous times, but all the conversations they had, um, he was able to help shape my father's life. There was no way to contact him, so I said, well, maybe someday he will see Tiger's picture in the paper and say Tiger Woods and make the connection and say that must be Woody's kid and get in touch with me. It never happened. And unfortunately we we did find out about three, four years ago what happened to him. After Nam fell, um, we uh, discovered that he was put into a, he was captured, uh, put into a concentration camp, and he basically starved to death, beaten and starved to death. So um, it's, a, it's a terrible ending, so I carry his, his name in honor. There is a moral because it, the attributes are also there. Courage, aggressiveness, uh, intellect, leadership ability, 
all these things I wanted Tiger to have. As Tiger's prodigious talent became obvious, Earl's military mind led him to devise a plan for Tiger's future. He and Tita were going to devote their lives to realizing the awesome potential of their son. We asked him what kind of sport he won, because in the school he loved to run. He loved to play a lot of sport too in school, baseball, basketball. I told Tiger, I said, you know what? You cannot be good in every sport. You have to choose the one you love the most. Whatever sport that you want, we will support you. Because each sport, they need this a lot of practice, a lot of things to do to get better. So he chose the golf. We didn't choose it, he chose it. Golf was my decision. I wanted to play it because I loved it. They were always encouraging me to try other things. So I, I'd go off and try, I'd try baseball. I would try track, I'd try cross country. Yeah, I liked it, it was fun, it was competitive, but it wasn't my love. I didn't have, I just didn't have the passion for it. You don't really instill anything into a child. You encourage the development of it by your at words, your deeds, the environment that you're in, how you react to situations, and you let the child grow. And golf is a great game for that. It's an honest game. You always have to be honest with yourself. If my ball rolls and moves in the grass off in the trees when no one sees it, with my club behind the ball, that's a penalty. I have to call that upon myself. Um, that's being honest. That's being true to yourself. And golf taught me that at an early age. Earl would become coach, psychologist, and family breadwinner. Tita would become companion, scorer, and drill instructor. I mean, she was the one getting up at you know, four in the morning to drive two hours to watch me play nine holes in a Pee Wee League. Um, she made the sacrifices. I walked through every tournament uh, with Tiger, and I always keep the score. Every single round of not only myself, but everyone in my group. And um, that was her thing. Sometimes he take too much serious. And he perfection, you know, he want everything. Every shot have to be perfect. This is the one supposed to be, and he get mad at himself. So I asked Tiger when he finished the tournament, I said, Tiger, who fall is that? Is the golf bag fall? Is your cup fall? Did your ball fall? Who hit the ball then? He said, me. I said, who fall is that? He said, me. I said, if it's you, why you hit the, your golf bag or you throw your club or you do something like that? It's not that equipment fall. It's your fall. If you want to hit, you hit on your head. You hit yourself. That's your, you the one fall, not the equipment fall. And he said, why does the big kid do that? I said, that is their problem, it's not mine. You are my kids. You're supposed to come out here to have fun. This is just a game. You are my son, 
my responsibility is you, not other kids. So he knows that. When Tiger was six, he committed a cardinal sin. He was beaten by a local club pro, lost his temper, and refused to shake hands. Tita laid down the law. Did she ever? She, uh, boy, that's uh, a moment I'll never forget, too, because I was just a little kid, and she, uh, she got in my grill pretty good. Because that is not, she always said, that is not how my son behaves. And not only did you respect yourself, you disrespected me, you disrespected your father, and you disrespected your entire family for how you acted and behaved. And that will never happen again. Plain and simple. <laughs> and you know that, uh, you know, I, I get scared of, of my mom more so than my dad. Uh, my mom was a disciplinarian. My dad was a softie. People think he's a green beret, he's a real tough guy, but uh, my, my father was more of the negotiator. I could actually negotiate with him and, and get, get things, and sometimes he wouldn't give them, sometimes he would. Mom, no, black or white. I am very tough with him, and he knows it. Not with dad. Dad only used the voice and tone, but I said the tiger, no matter how big you are, I can beat you. I can spank you. And he knows that what I mean. <laughs> so he, he, he knows that. Tiger's exceptional talent meant fame before he went to school. He was hounded for his autograph before he could write. His reputation brought the inevitable cameras and microphones. Tiger thought that fame and public adulation were normal. All of the girls on my staff just went absolutely crazy. He was such a cute little guy. And they, and they said the women will shriek when he walks out, and they were absolutely right. They did. Bob, I know you love baseball, but I also know you love golf, and I have someone here to challenge you, OK? So right now, I'd like you to meet Tiger Woods and his father, Earl Woods. Would you come up? And when he walked out with a little bag of clubs over his shoulder, he made a lot of friends. Tiger, come here a minute. You, do you know who this is? You know who this man is here? What's the man's Turn name, around, Tiger? Turn around and look at him, Tiger. What is this that man, man right name? here? What is his name? <laughs> huh? <laughs> <laughs> Not only does he not know, but he doesn't care. Well, he broke the place down, and and he was, it was so. At one point, he was, I was talking to him, and he he, he just he was rubbing his ear. I never forgot it, and I, I, I said afterwards, is he having to his father? Is he having a problem? And he said, no, he's just he was a little nervous. I was so lucky to be able to meet Bob Hope. Um, I got a chance to rub elbows with him and, and Mike Douglas and a lot of other different famous people that I had no clue at the time. He was just someone making fun of me. He thinks his right? dancing is going to wax right himself yeah. here. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but when you put a golf club in my hand, all that goes away. And I, I, I feel completely comfortable then. <laughs> I remember saying, let's have a little putting contest. And he put a ball down, this little fella, and hit two putts and set it up very nice and then took the ball and put it very close to the cup and knocked it in. I thought Bob Hope was going to pass out. All of us just it got such a big laugh. <laughs> you know, I've interviewed 40 some odd thousand people, seven presidents, everybody you can think of has been on my show. And all the comment I get everywhere is, when you had Tiger Woods on the show, he was amazing. They all remember that. Where did you learn how to play? My dad taught me. Is he a good player? Yes. Better than you? Yeah, real better. How good are you right now? 
Very good. Why are you getting so good? Practice. Is that right? Mm -hmm. How much do you practice? About a whole bunch. You don't win all the time, do you? Yeah, I don't win all the time because so, sometimes I just fool around. I mean, if you put your mind to it, you can win every time you want to? Yeah. You know, I, I still got in trouble. I still did all the things around the house and played with my friends and um, still did all, all the other things that every other kid did. It's just that there was another side of me, and that was, you know, my results on a golf course, people were, in, were interested in that. And I, you know, as a young, young kid, I didn't understand why. I just accepted that's just the way it, it was. You know, if, if I was successful here, then these people want to talk to me about it. I, I didn't take anything to it um, because I was, my dad put things in perspective real quick. Um, when I was five years old, I was on That's Incredible. This is Eldrick Tiger Woods, and Eldrick is an accomplished golfer. There was a girl on that show who could, you know, basically lift her parents up, you know, and, and do something that I, I couldn't do. And um, my dad was watching her. I, I walked in when she was warming up, and my dad says, uh, you think you can do that? I said, no. There's no way. Um, and he'd, he'd mention all these other little uh, examples of things that I couldn't do. And he says, what, you know what that means? There are a lot of other special people in this world. A lot of things that people can do that you can't do. And you must recognize that, that these people are exceptional. And everyone is exceptional in their own way. You just got to find that in them. When I'm going to be 20, I'm going to be Jen Nichols and Tom Watson. <laughs> put the foot down, no homework, no golf. You finish your homework and then you can play golf. That world was terrible, but it accomplished its, its main objective, which is um, to put a priority in my life. It was always family, school, and then golf. And um, so my, uh, my golf was uh, always secondary to my schooling. And that was one of the the biggest um, things that my, my mother kept harp, harping on me the entire time growing up. And then also my father, because my father had a decision to make. Um, because back when he was, he was young, his parents both died at a very early age, when he was, must have been 11 and 13. But his father wanted him to become a professional baseball player. Well, his mother always wanted him to get his education. So it was always, get your education, son, professional baseball player. Get your education, son, professional baseball player. He went for his education. And um, so I had both sides um, hit me at the same time, my father and my mother, both harping on my education, being number one. So if, if I didn't have my homework done to the excellence that it should have been done at, the aptitude it should have been done at, because they know that I was sharp enough to get A's, and if I didn't apply the same amount of effort into school as I did golf, then I wasn't able to play golf. So um, I got very used to focusing on my schooling. And I, actually, I used a lot of my focus that I learned from golf into school to help me get it done so that I could go play golf. One of the rules that we had in the house growing up as a, when I was a kid is that um, whenever I wanted to talk about something, um, whether, whether it took you know, two minutes or five hours, we'd get in these long conversations. Um, my father would stop whatever he was doing, put down the paper, put down whatever work he brought home, or turn off the TV, and we would talk one-on-one. -on -one. I never talked down to Tiger either physically 
or with my vocabulary. She always felt that it was more important for me to have a conversation eye to eye rather than someone looking down upon and where he could intimidate me because of size. He'd always get me and we'd sit down, or we'd sit on the bed, lie on the bed together, and we'd sit back and we'd just rap, we'd just start talking. Tiger developed the ability to not be ashamed of not knowing. And that's something many kids never learn, never get. And that interaction basically shaped my, my life. We earn mutual trust and respect. And our relationship was just as close as could be. Um, a lot of those conversations we had um, were life-changing. By the time Tiger was four, it became obvious that he needed professional coaching. Earl and Tita approached Rudy Duran, a golf pro at Hartwell Park in Long Beach. One day, uh, Tita came in with Tiger, and I uh, remember the Tiger could barely see over the counter. He was just four years old, and uh, she asked me if uh, I would help him with his golf game, and I'd let him play there. Um, so I said, well, let's take a look what's going on in the driving range. So we went down to the driving range, and uh, I remember Tiger not, not saying anything all the way down there. I had his little carry bag with him. And uh, so I teed four balls up, and he took out his little uh, cut down two and a half wood. And I uh, took that thing out and just hit, tch, 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 tch. He had like four perfect shots in a row. And I said, whoa, I would love to help you, and you can play here anytime you want. was there to let me basically play at Hartwell when um, you know, my dad was able to play Navy golf course, but I wasn't old enough to play. He had to be 10 or older, and um, I was only four at the time, so uh, Rudy was kind enough to let me come over there and, and hit a couple balls and, um, and give me lessons. And uh, from then on, we had junior golf tournaments every Saturday, which I look forward to, and I prepared all week for that junior golf tournament. And uh, we had our handicaps there posted and it was a, uh, man, it was a great time in our lives. And all the kids in my junior program really were 11, 12 years old and, and really didn't have the poise and the skill of a low handicap golfer. They were learning and it was very evident that almost all of them were learning and, and, and it was fine. But Tiger was like a, amazing at uh, four years old. By the time he was five, uh, you know, he was like a two handicap golfer. Rudy was there to instill a lot of fundamentals. I mean, I, had, I didn't have any clue about the game. I just, my dad basically helped me with the fundamentals, but I just hit it. And I remember him and my dad at home trying to figure out um, the length of my clubs, how long they should be. Tiger, of course, he was not very tall, and he needed clubs that, that fit him. Because um, they always wanted to have me fitted in clubs, so I didn't have to adjust my body to the club. Uh, the club should always fit the person. This way you could develop your golf swing with your swing motion, not by manipulating a club that's either too long, generally too long, or too short for you. playing golf, it was very obvious to me that Tiger was as good, if not better, 
I say if not better, Tiger was better than me playing golf. And, uh, but I would shoot lower scores. And I go, well, this is not right. So I adjusted uh, par for him. So I came up with Tiger par. So if he hit four perfect shots on the green and then two putts, that was a Tiger par six. So if I made a par, a par four, and he made a uh, Tiger par six, then we were even on the hole. It was kind of neat because then I could always gauge how I played. You know, um, I could always say, hey, I shot under par today, Daddy. You know, you know I was so cool, I shot under par because it was my par. But I was the one that decided what the par was. So if he had perfect shots, three perfect shots on the green and two putts, that's a par five. And if he hold the putt, then it'd be a par four. So then we were able to compete, and he always wanted to play the same tees. So we were able to compete on, a, on an equal level if I adjusted his par to his distance base. But I always hated when they adjusted the par I got longer. You know, and I, and I was able to just, you know, I'm like 10 yards short of the green, so they said, okay, you can reach the green. I said, oh, I can't get to the green. No, you can reach it. It's like a um, long par, for us nowadays, maybe like a long par four where you can't quite get to it. Um, that's kind of how they equated it to. Watching him play was more than amazing. And, and I remember playing with him, you know, many times and we'd be out on the golf course and we'd be going along and he'd be hitting and he might be over there to the side and he'd have a shot and, and it was not that easy of a shot and he'd hit this amazing shot and I'd look around and go, whoa, did anybody see that? That's unbelievable. And of course, no one was there but us, and so, well, move right on along. And uh, it was great. He could hit as many as 10 perfect shots in a row. And uh, no, that was amazing to see. I, you know, I haven't seen anything like it yet. Prior to working with Tiger, I used to think that learning to hit golf balls was like a formula. Once you had the formula perfect, once you had it, then you would always hit straight. And of course, I was always frustrated because that really never happened. And then when Tiger came, I was able to see here a young man at five years old was able to hit the ball perfectly almost every time and knew nothing about the golf swing. So it was pretty obvious it wasn't an intellectual formula to be able to hit good shots. It really was more natural ability. And then what you did with that natural ability is, was what Tiger did with his skills. And what I did as a coach is try to help him develop those natural abilities. He had a little bit of a stutter, and he was really quite cute. He would say, Rudy, what was my par on that hole? And I go, well, that, uh, you, that last putt was for a par. And then he would, he would question it sometimes. You sure that wasn't for a birdie? I go, no, I'm sure it was par. Remember, you went one, two, three, four, two putts, and par. Now, he was very competitive at a very early age. Uh, we would have chipping contests. You know, and he would always expect to win in the junior golf tournaments. He's six years old playing against 17-year-olds. Uh, he would expect to win. I mean, this it wasn't like, you know, for me, no, I'm going to beat these guys, and that's the end of the deal. Now, he wouldn't talk the talk. He would just go out and get the job done. He would just go play. He was intense. One shot at a time, boom, 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 check the scores when he comes in. You know, he knew where everyone was, and he liked to win. Pretty competitive and I love to tease him about it too I used to tell him that I owned him and so at the end of the day I go well I own you I beat you again and he go, I had a sports car at the time and uh, we were driving back from uh, playing golf and I said yep I own you again today and he looked up and he says well, well Rudy the police own you because <laughs> I got way too many tickets and he would tease me on that so no matter what was happening, he was going to make sure there was some kind of a competitive edge. He got the last laugh. Tiger had broken 50 for nine holes, 
at the age of three. By six, he was scoring in the 90s for 18. At the age of eight, he won the junior world title, a feat he would repeat four times. By 1988, when Tiger became a teenager, he already needed the kind of support team appropriate for a superstar. Earl created a team around Tiger. John Anselmo, a pro at Meadowbank Golf Course in Huntington Beach, was the first recruit. I had never seen, actually, a child with that much ability with a golf swing at, at that age. I've seen many kids in my life, which I've taught, but this one possessed such a great rhythm and, and instinct for the game. And the surprising thing about Tiger was that he was very positive about what he was trying to do. He was practicing hard then and just kept doing it for years. So what I saw no. in Tiger was a, a good no. future. Came right out of it it's hard to believe when you look at a young child, but that one possessed so much inner talent and control that I was amazed. <laughs> and he just practiced all the time. He practiced at night. <laughs> He'd be putting at night on the putting green when he was growing up. Yeah. So he was just dedicated, what you want to call it. He wanted to achieve something. Jay Brunza, a captain in the U.S. Navy and a San Diego psychologist, completed the team in 1989. Jay, at the time, we didn't know he was even a psychologist. We just, I just knew him as Jay. And then we played golf with him every Saturday. He'd drive up from San Diego and we'd play golf. And that was the end of it. And we just had a great time, and he was a good golfer. It all started out as kind of a social event. They knew I was a naval officer. Uh, no idea what my background and training was at that time. So I started getting a little older and he's, we started talking about it more and he, he was a psychologist and uh, what he would do with, with you know, kids, especially child psychologists, to these kids with cancers and other debilitating diseases and he'd help them out mentally. So I, I wonder if that could help me. Earl asked me if uh, I would be willing to work with Tiger uh, and he wanted Tiger to have the advantage of a lot of the young kids uh, at that time that were, were hooked up with, uh, with you know, physical trainers, sports psychologists, and people like that. And uh, I felt that I had enough background and experience because I knew that was a remarkable talent. When I was a kid, I, I never thought I had the talent. I never thought I had the gifts to play the game. I knew I had a little bit, a little bit to compete. But I, I thought my biggest edge is I wanted to beat you. The killer instinct, either you have it or you don't. When he was young and I see that he got the killer instinct, I encourage him. I try to tell him this, uh, when you are ahead, you got to finish it off.
That's my rush. That's my thrill, is coming down a stretch and knowing the fact that I kicked everybody's butt. That, to me, is fun. That's the way it's supposed to be. When, when it's over, okay, we are friends. But when in that time, in the sport, the competition, you have to do it. There is no, there's no feeling that I've found so far that uh, matches a feeling of knowing that I've beaten everybody. It's just, uh, you know, everyone has the same opportunity. It's just that, um, you know, I've come out on top. And uh, that is, knowing that all the hard work and preparation that goes into just one victory, which is what makes it so satisfying. what we we have to do in order to win you have to step on their throat that's just part of it and in order to uh, there's nothing wrong with being you have to be gracious you have to be, be respectful um, but the attitude that you have to bring to the table is one of you know I'm gonna win and what's second place second place is first loser so you know, winning is everything, and um, that's that's how I look at it. You know, I love to win, and um, you know, I just don't, I just can't stand finishing second. Like my ride's too much. By 14, Tiger hadn't come second very often. What do you got there? Eight. No it's shot. Cut. Eight. Of the 400 plus tournaments he had played, he had won 260. He had made three holes in one and was preparing for his fourth junior world title with Jay Brunza. When I come down and stay with him at the junior world championships, we do some, some sessions. It was pretty cool of how it helped me uh, understand a different part of my creativity. Tiger was tremendous because he has such a gifted creative imagination. But I could never control it. I mean, I, could understand, I couldn't fathom someone saying, you know, visualize the golf shot. Well, I visualize, I see this ball going every which way. My creative mind will never see me a golf, a golf shot doing this or doing this. My mind would not let me to do that. It'd see it going all over the place. So. He said, why don't you just feel it, use, use your hands, use your fingers, use your, your body awareness to, to harness your creativity that way and, and come up with an answer. And um, he was very instrumental in, in teaching me how to control my creative mind. I sort of used to chuckle when everybody would say, oh, wow, that tiger, he hits it so far. And I'd sort of gently say, well, he does. He's long off the tee, and he's got a great power game. He said that the genius of Tiger Woods is his creative imagination in the short game. to have these these blackout moments where I don't remember. I know I was there, but I don't remember actually performing the golf shot. The athlete in the peak performance zone uh, is 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 really in a in a kind of a heightened state of awareness, uh, an absorbed focus. 
there's an element of relaxation response that goes on in there and they're always in the here and the now with kind of a clear uncluttered mind just absorbed in the moment letting the performance happen rather than thinking about or helping the performance happen. I get so entrenched on the moment, I guess my subconscious might take over. I don't know what the whole terminology is, but there are many putts or many shots where I don't remember hitting. I know, I remember seeing the ball flight, I remember preparing for the shot, pulling the club out of the bag, and once I'm behind the ball, I'm walking in the shot, I don't remember until I see the ball leave. It's a, it's a, weird, a weird thing. You're looking to get that focus and that process to take place within a time frame, I call it the 40-second sanctuary of the pre-shot routine. The more the intense the situation gets, the calmer I feel, the more things slow down. It's, it's a weird sensation. It's hard to kind of articulate on it. For some reason, the last few holes take forever, but they may be happening a lot faster for some reason, but they seem like they're taking longer. times where I don't hear noise, I don't, I don't hear anything. It's just I've become so enthralled in that particular moment, hitting a shot, performing a, a task, and being mentally prepared for that shot. And it's almost as if I get out of the way um, because of the training. My father was in the Special Forces. There are a lot of times when he said the training would just take over, and it was as if my body was doing the work, and I was just sitting back and watching it do it. And that's what it feels like when you're in, in, in golf. Well, for me, is that it just happens. I just get out of my own way and let the training just take over. It all started back when I was about uh, 13. Um, I wanted to become tougher. I felt there was something missing. My physical game was getting better. My mental game was good enough, but there was something missing. There was something that would take me to another level mentally. And uh, I felt like as if I wasn't on the same level as the kids I was competing as the 17 year olds, you know, four years, that's a big gap between someone who's 13 and 17. Um, not only in the physical attributions, but also mentally, your mental capacity is so different. And I felt as if there's something missing. So I asked my dad, can you make me tougher where I could compete against these kids who are older than me? He says, all right, well, it's not going to be easy. I'm going to have to apply the same type of green beret training that I learned. And, and he would get in my face about it. He would get so angry with me. They would look at me and grit his teeth. But he wasn't permitted to say a word. He could say one word. And that one word was the release word, that the whole training was over. And he never uttered that word. Because I wanted it to happen to me. But even though I, what made it more frustrating is I knew what he was doing, and I still couldn't stop the frustration. See, that's what made it frustrating is I couldn't handle it at first. And it, I kept getting a, a bigger tolerance, you know, over time. I kept understanding it. You know, how, how can I cope with it? If someone's getting in my grill, and when she, he didn't make you feel just miserable. Man, did he get angry with me. Because I would do all kinds of things to mess him up. And usually on the golf course. Um, just as he's beginning to swing, I dropped my whole bag of clubs. And he would stop 
and look at me, those teeth gritting. And he'd start again, I'd throw a dozen golf balls in front of his ball. But he'd never push me over the edge. He would take me right up to the breaking point and he'd back off. He'd stop again and I'd say, hey, look, are you through showboating? The, the marshal says we have to complete this round in four hours and you're taking up more than your share of the time. So either hit or go get off the course. And then he would stripe it. Just hit it perfect and turn around and look at me. And never say a word, but that look said, now take that and go walking down the fairway. Eventually it would take more and then more and then more and then more to finally to the point where it didn't didn't bother him anymore. It's a tiger. The training is over. I said, you've got it. And I promise you that you'll never meet another person as mentally tough as you in your entire life. And he hasn't, and he never will. Tiger was ready for the endless struggle of the golfer against the game and against himself. I knew I could attain another level. And once I attained that level, I knew there was something else out there. I could always, I could always sense it, I could always feel it. There's always another level to attain. And then once I got to that level, Yes, it was much easier to play the game, but the more you learn about the game, the more you, you increase your awareness of these other levels, um, the more you feel like you're, you're never going to get there. So it's just a, a never-ending struggle, which is great, you know, because you can always get better. And that you never get there. It's, it's, a, it's a journey where there's, there's no arrival. And that's the, the beauty of it that you can always become better the next day. Um, it's pretty cool to think about in, in that sense, is that uh, tomorrow I'll be a better player than I was today. And um, hopefully the next day can you know, repeat itself throughout my entire career. But that's okay. Earl had retired in 1988. His income was limited, but Tiger's costs were rising. Tiger's burgeoning talent took the team on the road. I retired from McDonnell Douglas, and now it was my job to take him to tournaments. And these tournaments were all over the United States. So the money was tight. We'd get there the morning of the tournament, no practice round. Tiger's half sleep was from the flight. And one day he said to me, Pa, do you think we could get here out of the tournament early enough so I can get a practice round in. And can we stay at, at the hotel where all the other kids stay? And I said, son, yes. I said, from this day on, you will have all the advantages that a country club kid has. I don't know how I'm going to do it financially, but I'll do it. I immediately went over the bank, got a home equity loan, and I used it in the summer, paid for it in the winter. We had various jobs. 
and roles to play. And I was a parent, obviously, and he was obviously the kid. And I was a parent all the way up to the time he had to go out for his first practice round. And then he took over. And it was very interesting when, when Earl, Tiger, and I would go on the road, Tiger was the boss. And Earl and I would take orders, you know, uh, aye aye sir, kind of thing. And he would tell me what time he wanted to go to practice. That was his job, I mean, his, his option. He'd tell me what time he wanted to go, what time we had to get up, because he always had to calculate this stuff. Yeah, one take! <laughs> then he would play, and then he would decide whether he had to practice some more on the driving range, or that we'd go home. And if he said, I've got to practice, I've got to work on something. I just sat there and waited for him to finish. And then when he said, okay, we can go home now, then we go home. And at the end of the tournament, and the award ceremonies are over, the roles switch back. For Tiger, life at high school was as normal as his fame would allow. I felt very uncomfortable with it. We had one cameraman come into the room and I, I told my parents that next day, or that night, I can't do that. I, I don't like that, that attention. You know, my friends are my friends, and what I do in my schooling is my, my schooling. But what I do on the golf course, I don't have a problem with you taking a picture or, or looking at me through a camera. That's fine, I understand that, because that's what causes it all. My schooling did not cause me to have a warrant some cameraman to come into my school and take a look at me. Um, I'm not that smart. So, you know, that camera does not, be in, does not belong in there. If he wants to film me hitting a golf shot because that's what someone wants, wants to see because they think I can do it okay, then that's fine. Um, but not in my school, no. Now, um, much of the clown's success may be attributed to the contract. It's pretty neat to have parents that understood that never forced that upon me. You know, that they said it was okay. You know, we'll, we'll accept that and that's just, we're not, it's never gonna happen again. I'm still very shy. Uh, you know, all my friends will, will say that too. I am, I am shy. But as I have gotten older, I've become more comfortable being in front of a camera and talking to people. And I had a very difficult time as a kid talking to people because I was very shy. And um, you know, you learn. And I took a speech class in, in junior high and a little bit in high school to try and get over that, trying to overcome my shyness and to be able to, to speak and debate issues in front of people, in front of large audiences and be judged upon that. And I, I treat it as a, as a challenge to myself and I'm, I'm shy and I wanna try and get over this. You know, it's um, something that I know that I need to be able to do. I know I have to talk in front of people, but I have no problem talking in front of friends. Now, why is it I can't talk in front of you know, larger audiences if I can talk in front of friends? It's the same thing. So I got into speech and debate and, and basically learned um, how to overcome it. Well, in the living room, there was a couch, and there was a table over there, and then there was a fireplace. 
what I do is I put the trophies on top of there and I work on my flop shot. And if you know my mom, if you break anything in that house or damage it even to a slight extent, my butt would be so red, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. So it just gave me an extra incentive you know, to hit proper flop shots. And um, you know, I hit shots, I'd hit shots. So if anything, the only thing I would ruin would be my own trophies. So that's why I put them on top of the table. That was my way of obviously challenging myself to hit it high enough, but also if I didn't hit it high enough, I'd only break the trophy that I won, but not my mom's table. She didn't know that. I hope she doesn't see this. <laughs> Bomber, I would take my allowance money and we'd play putting games. I'd come back with you know, a pocket full of quarters. Well, you know, I'd turn that into dollars and blah, 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 blah. And my dad just got tired of this and said, you know, what are you doing? I said, I'm just putting for money. He says, okay, no more putting for money. Fine, no more putting for money. So, uh, you know, a week or two goes by, I come back with a pocket full of dollars and he says, uh, what are you doing? I thought, I thought I told you no putting for money. I didn't put for money. I played on the golf course for skins. I want a few skins. <laughs> and he just looked at me and he said, all right, fine. No more gambling. That's it. Done. I said, what do I mean? He says, that's it. I said, all right, fine. So that was the end of it. Tiger learned his first lesson about being born into a minority family in America at an early age. We went from kindergarten to the first grade. Tiger felt it, because he was the only one. The older kids uh, at recess tied him to a tree and then threw rocks at him. And Tiger didn't tell me about it for two or three days. And when I found out, I go to the principal, and the principal said to me, will you please let me do my job? That's all I ask. I said, yes, I will. So he gave me a report. He found out who the teachers were that were out there. He found out the kids that had done it. And he told me the punishments that were administered. And I said, good job. Earl had played collegiate baseball at a time when a black man could not eat in the same restaurant as his white teammates. A generation later, Tiger had to face prejudice that was less obvious, but that was still there. As a minority, I had to deal with a lot of different things about, about golf I didn't want to have to deal with, the things I had to go through that uh, I didn't want to have to go through. There aren't many of you out there. And when four of you get together and go on the tee, the first tee, all the chit-chat stops. Because everybody's watching you. To see, what the hell are they doing here? and see what you're gonna do. And they can't do anything about it, but you can sense they didn't, they didn't want you there. <laughs> and I said to Tiger, you feel it? He said, mm-hmm. That's the look. Always feel it. You can always sense it. Um, people are always staring at you. What are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. Um, when I go to Texas or Florida, you always feel it, because uh, they're saying, why are you here? You're not supposed to be here. And uh, that's probably because that's where all the slavery was. So, uh, oh well. I think he developed kind of a thick skin about that. Uh, as he got older, I know that, that you know, there have been death threats uh, from people who, you know, obviously are disturbed or, or frustrated or whatever, but you know, he's lived with that in his life. Tiger realized that his African-American background would preordain him as golf's great black hope. 
He was happy to carry the mantle of predecessors like Charlie Sifford, who had struggled for acceptance in the game. Well, first of all, I acknowledge those guys because of, without Charlie's efforts, obviously the Caucasian cause, I don't know how long that would have been instilled. We don't know if that would have been knocked off during the 60s or it could have kept going for perpetuity. We don't know. Um, but if, without him, Lee Elder wouldn't have had a chance. Calvin Pete wouldn't have had a chance. Jim Thorpe wouldn't have had a chance. And I certainly wouldn't have had a chance because I know my father wouldn't have been able to play the game at, when he started. But Tiger didn't want to be regarded as just a black golfer at the expense of his broader, multi-ethnic background. I don't shun away from my, my black heritage at all. Uh, I certainly welcome it. But I don't appreciate when someone doesn't respect that I have an Asian mother. Um, because she is my mom, I love her to death. And I'm a mixture of both races. And by saying that I'm only black is absolutely disrespecting my mother. And I would never disrespect my mother. He said that because it means he denied me as a mother. And my mother's side, that kind of thing. So they have to understand that, that Tiger not just only have one black drop in his blood, he got every drop in his blood. I always uh, made fun of myself because I'm, I'm kind of a United Nations. You know, I'm, I'm from everywhere. ethnic and it's as simple as that he doesn't want to use his ethnicity as a, any kind of a calling card he wants to be known simply as a mi minority golfer he refuses to be painted into a corner you're not gonna box him in he's a lot of things to a lot of different people he realizes that and, and I don't see that there's anything wrong with it. I mean, every time you think of golf, you automatically think of Tiger. Great swing, terrific smile. Transcend uh, the races. Charisma that won't quit. It's a role model for everybody in the world. Tiger presence, wherever he goes, seems to draw the crowd. We all claim it. You know, everybody claims it. Tiger, 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 tiger. Ladies watch Tiger, too. Sure, he's Tiger, girl. Even, you know, even uh, the Anglo community embraces him. Yes! He does have universal appeal. Yeah, the smile just works every time. Totally winning. I think he motivated a whole lot of people, young, old, black, white, all different nationalities. I think that's the the most positive part of A, Tiger Woods is extraordinarily great at what he does. B, by virtue of his ethnicity, it's, it's worthy of attention because golf has essentially been lily white uh, until now. He has had to deal with things that I myself would have never had to deal with. I never had anybody tell me I couldn't play at a course or I wasn't allowed to do this or wasn't allowed to do that. So he's had to deal with things that I can't even fathom that he dealt with. And he's dealt with them phenomenally. He's a credit to himself. That acceptance doesn't happen today. That it won't happen tomorrow. But it will happen one day, and it will happen person by person and gradually, generation by generation. And it's, it's up to me, it's up to all golfers who are on the tour, um, especially minorities who are involved in the game, you know, to teach our, our young kids, our aspiring kids, that it's, that's not the way. That's not the way it is. That's not the way golf is. It's the way golf used to be, but that's not the way it's going to be. In 1991, at the age of 15, Tiger's career began to move from the remarkable to the unique. 
He became the youngest ever player to win the U.S. Junior Amateur at Bay Hill, Florida. I worked so hard to win that tournament. I think that's when my dad finally realized how much winning really means to me. I think he kind of always knew, but he'd never seen me cry, not after a win. Um, he certainly seen me cry when he's had to put, um, you know, fucking his, his uh, antibiotics on my knees from skateboarding accidents and stuff. <laughs> that hurt a lot. But um, he, no, he never, he never seen me cry after winning. That was the first time he's ever seen me do that. A year later, it became an unprecedented repeat junior amateur when he beat Mike Wilson. Tiger was defending champion. And of course, in sport, one of the most difficult things in the world is to repeat. You could just feel the pressure. I mean, it, it was just like you were in the middle of, of the biggest pressure cooker you could find anywhere on the planet. I'm sensitive to reading the affect of the moment. And I say, thinking to myself, boy, you know, if I'm feeling the pressure, I know Tiger's feeling the pressure. So I look at Tiger and I just sort of semi-smiled at him in our normal way of relating. And I said to him, hey, Tiger, I said, you know, it's getting pretty hard to swallow out here, isn't it? <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, hard to swallow for you. How'd you like to have to hit this next wedge shot? All you're doing is walking. <laughs> so we you know, kind of broke the moment. Then it was a triple. He came from two down with two to play to beat Ryan Armour. I think one of the more exciting moments in Tiger's career would be the, uh, uh, the last U.S. Junior in Waverly, where he was two down with two to go. Nobody in the history of golf had ever won three U.S. Juniors in a row. And to, uh, to see him, you know, kind of capture the moment and, you know, really both of us go deep into a zone of focus, knowing the importance of the next two holes. It was like we were both in our own little world, in our own little zone, and everything else. It was just like silence. Very crisp, very brief interchange. Not a lot of dialogue. I mean, we were just zoned in and focused and fading the pressure of the moment. I was lucky enough to, to, to get things going my way at the right time, you know, to change the momentum of the match. He's got that great gift of the champion, and that is, under moments of pressure, he has the ability to elevate his game to the next level. You see that in the great elite athletes. I'd have to say my U.S. juniors are more, are more um, more difficult to attain than the three U.S. amateurs. Because the three U.S. amateurs, you can win at any age. Um, the, at the U.S. junior, you only have, a, you have an age limit. You have 17 as your, your top end. And uh, you have to start winning at an early age. And there's a big physical uh, disadvantage that a 15- you know, to 14-year-old has versus a 17-year-old. Not only maturity, but also physical ability. The 17-year-old is so much stronger. and uh, you know, I had to try and overcome that somehow, and uh, was, was fortunate enough to be able to do that. Tiger's talent had attracted the attention of college coaches even before he'd started high school. 
the golf coach at the University of Stanford had written to him, asking him to consider Stanford for his college education. The maturity of Tiger's reply amazed the college authorities. It began. Dear Coach Goodwin, thank you for your recent letter expressing Stanford's interest in me as a future student and golfer. At first, it was hard for me to understand why a university like Stanford was interested in an 11-year-old. But after talking with my father, I have now come to understand and appreciate the honor you have given me. It took me, geez, I don't know how many drafts. I, must, I messed up so many times, didn't know what to say. What do you say to a college coach and then you're 11 years old? I mean, what do you say? And uh, I must have done at least 10, 12 different drafts on this letter. I kept revising, kept revising it. I wanted to sound articulate. I wanted to sound smart um, and present myself well. And, uh, and, and so that he understood that, you know, that I was not a dumb person, that I actually could um, possibly one day go to college and maybe be lucky enough to get into a, a place like Stanford. Several years later, Tiger did go to Stanford. He came to the school as one of the most heralded athletes ever at Stanford University, which has an incredible athletic tradition. And when he came there, there was a huge buzz, although in Palo Alto, where the school is located, all those students are exceptional in one way or another. So in that sense, I think it was a good fit for Tiger in that even though he'd always been the, the center of attention his whole life, at Stanford, every kid he, he was alongside uh, was a standout in some way, whether it was in physics or uh, economics or ballet or art. As he told me back then, he said, in high school, he said, I set the curve. When I got to Stanford, I followed it. And for him, that was, that was a unique experience. I'll never forget how stupid I felt when I first got there. I get to my first section, I go to history. I listen to my lecture and we got our, our first section, which is broken down into, I think about 10 or 12 of us. Most of us are athletes. So I'm thinking I was perfect, you know, dumb jocks and you know, I could fit right in, no problem. You know, Stanford's gotta have a few dumb jocks and I'm sure I'm one of them. Um, I can't be the only one, right? Well. I get in there and there's a linebacker or a basketball player, uh, Tim Young, and a couple other guys in there. And I mean, all of a sudden we start talking about Descartes and this guy puts on his glasses and starts articulating. I'm like, oh my God, you're a linebacker. You're not supposed to be this smart. You're supposed to be some dumb muscle head. And I'm just looking over here going, oh my goodness, what did I get myself into? The very first practice we had as a team, I put my arm around him and, and I looked him and smiled and said, hey man, welcome to Stanford. I think we're gonna have a great team. You're gonna be the strongest freshman in the Pac-10. And That was our conference that we played in. And he looked at me and said, hey man, thanks. I really appreciate that. I'm looking forward to playing. I go, not because of your game, it's because you're gonna carry all our bags to the, to the van and, and to the hotel room. And, and he did that for the first few events, and then he made a deal. He said, well, if, if I shoot lowest score this tournament, I'm not going to carry the bags next week. And that kind of put an end to that, because he uh, started beating most of us on a regular basis. And, uh, but it was fun while it lasted. We had our own personal valet. I gave him the nickname Urkel after a sitcom here in the United States called Family Matters and Urkel was a character that had big glasses and, and was a big nerd and, and the very first time I saw him in his glasses after he'd taken his contacts out, he reminded me of that character and I stuck him with that nickname and we, we used it all year and it, bug, it bugged him but the more he complained the more we used it. gave me an extra challenge, which uh, I kind of liked. I kind of liked that 
I like that challenge that I had to step it up now. The high school seemed easy to me. This was not going to be easy. I could not coast my way through this. Um, I really had to work awfully hard, and uh, it was just eye-opening to have uh, these athletes, you know, be not their stereotypical meatheads. You know, um, they were extremely intelligent, articulate, and uh, very fascinating to talk to. So um, I had to step it up to another level, which uh, I kind of enjoyed. Having completed one amazing amateur golf triple, another even more astonishing followed. The first of three U.S. amateur victories came at Sawgrass in 1994. He had a sort of an inner strength and a timing for the dramatic. There were doubters, obviously, who wondered whether he was a flash in the pan or maybe a, a one-term of wonder, but he quickly dispelled that and, and showed that uh, this kid uh, had uncanny ability. The second came a year later at the age of 19. He won an unheralded third U.S. amateur to complete an amateur golf double-triple in 1996. He elevated his amateur reputation onto a par with the great Bobby Jones. To be a part of that conversation, at least you've done something special to attain it. You've been recognized as being part of history when you're able to cross generations like that, to go from the 1920s all the way into the 1990s and, and be a part of, the, of a conversation who, you know, who is the best amateur, um, whether it was Nicholas or whether it was um, Bobby Jones, um, whether it was myself or whomever it might be. Um, as long as you're in that conversation, you've done all right. Tiger's fame became universal. Fortune would soon follow as the Pro Tour beckoned. No matter how good you get, you always have to understand what it took to get there and the people that are involved. There were a lot of people who influenced my life and have shaped it. I have to say thank you to all those people. Earl had once said to Tiger, let the legend grow. As the world looked on in wonder, so it did.